Well, uh, hi everyone. It's a great honor for me to welcome Raven Chacon uh, here uh, to GSAP. Raven is an artist, composer, and performer. And for me, it's one of the most relevant artists now. I think his work is incredibly moving, but also speaking of uh, a specific and enacting specific tensions that are shaping the times we live in. Uh, his 2021 work, Three Sons, is composed of three videos of women beautifully singing the history of a landscape. Uh, one of the, of the songs speaks of the suffering of people who were forcefully relocated from 1830 to 1850. A second song about the Navajo long walk to Bosque Redondo, the 1864 deportation and attempt for uh, ethnic cleansing in the Navajo people, of the Navajo people by the U.S. federal government of the time. And a third, an elder, is singing about the removal of the Sem Seminole people from their lands during the 18, uh, 1800s. Uh, these words are incredibly impressive, but they're also mobilizing technical uh, uh, decisions as ones that allow to, to expand the capacity for those stories to, to be part of the present. His work, Silent Choir, is a recording of 304 or uh, 400 people standing in silence against the Dakota Access Pipeline at Standing Rock in North Dakota waiting for the police to respond as to why they are aiding in abusing the land, at, and, the land and its waters. Raven was born in 1977 in Fort Defiance, I hope I'm not revealing uh, something secret, <laughs> in Fort Defiance, Navajo Nation, Arizona. He's a graduate of the University of New Mexico where he obtained his BA in Fine Arts in 2001. He received a Master in Fine Arts from the California Institute of the Arts. His impressive body of work presents territories and, la as, and land as the entanglement of peoples, ecosystems, and technologies as the site of both occupation and resistance, and the sound as a medium that expands the capacity to collectively sense the violence, em the violence embedded in those entanglements. Sound becomes a medium to operate in the threshold of perception as the medium where histories of segregation manifest their presence as present realities that keep structuring contemp contemporary struggle. Sound is used as a medium to make the acknowledgement of those that have been othered unavoidable. His work is always collected in many different ways. It unfolds to a multitude of platforms of collaboration He's a composer in residence with the Native American Composer Apprenticeship Project. He developed part of his work as a member of the Native American art collective Post Commodity. In 2021, he started the record label 666 Distro to document rural and urban experimental musicians residing in Southwest United States. Raven's practice connects traditions, disciplinary boundaries, and medium, sound, video, printing. And that reflects in the great spectrum of recognition, recognitions that he accumulates, that, which is actually quite impressive. I would say that Raven has been recognized in so, by so many different uh, fields of, of work and, and cooperation. Uh, he uh, has been awarded a Creative Capital Grant he won the Berlin Prize for, by the American Academy in Berlin, and this year he won a, a Pulitzer Prize for his monumentous composition, Voiceless Mass. But adding to this, he's also been uh, in the most important uh, uh, art convenience, including Documenta 14, the 2022 uh, Whitney Biennial, or the Sydney Biennale, among many others. Uh, Raven will be responded tonight uh, by Lucia Le, professor here at GSAP and director of the Beale Center, who is developing and engaging in a long-term uh, project to explore land as a relational entity, and uh, land being already something that you're discussing as a term and an object. And Mario Gooden, artist and architect, who also teaches here, professor here at uh, GSAP, whose work uh, explores the fluid interconnection of bodies and territories. It's, this is incredibly exciting for me. Please join me welcoming Raven Chacon here tonight. Thank you, Andres and GSAP for having me. And thank you all for coming. I'm 
going to show some of the works that Andres has spoken about and some works all the way back to the first work that I made back in 1999. And as Andres was saying, most of my work is in sound and music. And that was uh, how I started making work, was uh, thinking of composition and thinking of different tactics and, and techniques for making sound and music. I didn't know that sound art was a thing. I was just doing these experiments independent of knowing that. It, it was years later that I, I saw you know, that this was a, a thing where these <laughs> experiments would fit into. These slides I have up right here are, uh, are pages from one of my scores. Uh, a graphic notation score called Adele Lago Yihosinigil Yedagi. I'm not going to go into this, but it's just an example of one of the graphic notation scores that I that I make. So that first piece that I had made back in 1999 that I'm uh, not embarrassed to keep showing in artist talks is a piece called Field Recordings. And the idea here was that I wanted to make recordings of places I knew to be very quiet around where I was living, where I come from, the Navajo Nation. And finding a, a time of day and finding a place where there was nobody around, there were no cars on the road, there were no airplanes in the sky, no animals, no wind, no rain. It's a desert, so there's not much rain anyway. So the first one that I took a recording of is Window Rock, Arizona. This is not too far from where I grew up in Chinle, Arizona. And this is a sacred place. Its, its name in Diné language is Tsega Hudsani. And um, it's considered a portal. And now it's, a, it's a, a tribal park. You can go and visit this place. So I went at a time when nobody was visiting and made a recording. And after I listened to the recording, I kept turning it up and turning it up, wanting to hear more. Maybe it was a failed experiment in that I, it was so quiet I couldn't hear anything. So I had to magnify it and magnify it. And so I took it back into the studio and turned it up to its maximum. Usually in artist talks, I play that about twice as loud, but uh, there's, a, there's a streaming at home audience, so we didn't want to you know, mess them up. I did the same at the foothills of the Sandia Mountains. And also at Canyon de Chez, which has the name of Seyi. And this is located between Chinle, Arizona, and Fort Defiance.
Drum grid is a composition for numerous drummers, each position on a different street corner. Beginning with a single drum hit from one player, subsequent drummers imitate the sound of the previous drummer down the block, with the gesture evolving as it travels around the neighborhood. Over time, the performers misinterpret their cues and source material, therefore adding new gestures to the original musical action. As nearby buildings and houses create false echoes and polyphony. By performing drum grid, a community has agency to change the landscape of their neighborhood, activating potential questions and new generative urgencies. And so this is a piece that can have up to 20 drummers. I think that's the most I've done with this so far. And the score has instructions, text instructions of how it's played. And then a map is developed of where the drummers will be situated. Here's a photo of it being performed in Oslo, Norway. And this is a video of us doing it in Colorado Springs. In 2009, I joined a collective post-commodity, which has had a rotating membership over the years and is made up of indigenous artists from different tribes. This is a piece I like to show in presentations called My Blood is in the Water. And I like to refer to it as a clock. This was a sculpture that was put up for four days during the Santa Fe Indian Market, which is a gathering every year uh, where indigenous artists can sell what they make. Oftentimes this is called craft, you know, jewelry, different, uh, different objects, artworks that get sold on that day. And it's not the best conditions to exhibit art either. It's a very uh, commercial space. But at the same time, Santa Fe has always been a market, or it's been a market for 500 years, maybe even before that, um, a meeting place of different tribes. And so we put up this sculpture as a way to acknowledge that spot in Santa Fe, which is near the the Santa Fe Plaza. It's in the courtyard of a museum called the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts. And the reason I call it a clock is that it tells time in three different ways. First, as a sundial. The second is that there's blood dripping out of the deer's mouth every 15 seconds onto a drum that's amplified. And the third way is that in all of its elements, which were all gathered from the area, the poles, the drum, the deer, is telling from top to bottom the story of that place. So starting with the sky, a time when 
there was nothing living in that area. Maybe, maybe just plants, no animals yet. And further down, you have the deer, representing a time when animals existed, but perhaps no humans yet. Inside of the deer, you have the blood, and that being the indigenous people of what's now known as New Mexico. And all of that stirring around inside of the animal. Depending on the animal's body, to, to survive, and then dripping out and having a long, uninterrupted lineage until it hits the head of the drum, and that being the contact with the Spanish when the Spanish arrived to the area. And all of that blood pooling up on the head of the drum and becoming a new people, a mixture of Spanish and Indian blood, and then dripping back off into the ground. In the early days of the collective, we were experimenting with different objects, different things we would find in sporting goods stores. And one of them that we came across was this balloon called a scare-eye balloon. Here you can see an uh, Amazon ad for Bird X scare-eye bird repellent balloon, which you're supposed to put in your trees and they're supposed to scare away pigeons or birds that are eating your crops. They don't work. We <laughs> tested those. But we had this, this test or this idea. If a 10-inch diameter balloon can at least attempt to scare away pigeons, then maybe a 10-foot diameter balloon could ward off Western civilization. And so we made a giant one, and we flew it over different sites as experiments just to see what would happen. And so this was flown in 2007, the, the first balloon we made. And this is flown over the sheriff's office of Maricopa County. His name was Sheriff Joe Arpaio, uh, very racist, <laughs> anti-immigrant man. And uh, this was, he was the first kind of uh, audience for this. We then made another one up in Canada. 
And this one was less of a guerrilla action. This was in collaboration with the Manitoba Hydro Corporation. Manitoba Hydro being the company that manages the water in uh, the province that has uh, the most fresh water in North America. And so this, this one was to function differently. This was to consider a, a watchful eye that everyone and all of the public should have when thinking about who's managing their resources. So this was a way to kind of tell the corporation that they are being watched back and that the public is the ones who should be stewarding this land and this water. But really these tests and these experiments were all for a bigger purpose of something that we really wanted to do with these, these ready-made objects. And it was a piece called Repellent Fence. The idea of Repellent Fence was that we wanted to suture both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border together. And in doing so, would trace corridors and paths longitudinally that have been there since time immemorial. Tribes that would trade, would visit, would exchange ceremony, would exchange knowledge, and all of this, of course, being interrupted by the border. And so this would be a gesture, again, only four days to, to bring those two sides back together symbolically. I'm going to talk about where we ended up doing this because this is an interesting story and uh, is always fun to talk about. We, we knew we wanted to do it in Arizona, partially because half the collective was based there at the time. It's also where I was, I guess, technically uh, born and raised. And also, uh, of course, back to Sheriff Joe Arpaio, that that policy that Arizona has of, of not only anti-immigration, but very racist rhetoric. And so we had originally wanted to do this on the Tohono O'odham Reservation. That is this area right here. And their traditional territory extends into Mexico. So we went out there. <clears throat> Actually, my godmother's from that, that community. And we told them our, our idea, and some community members and elders had shared with us. They said, we really love the, <clears throat> the gesture and the metaphor of, of what you're saying here. And, um, but the truth is that we don't want any more eyes on us. And he showed us, this man took us out to the desert and showed us this cactus. And this cactus had a small hole in it. And in that hole was a camera. And so <clears throat> he let us know that, and we understood that they are under constant surveillance and didn't want, even though they wanted the world to know that their way of life has been interrupted by this border, they didn't really want any more attention uh, down there. We were going to go this way. There's an um, Air Force range. They wouldn't let us do it there. We were going to do it here, but there's a bird sanctuary. So that wasn't going to fly, no pun intended. Um, over here is a very mountainous region. We thought about doing it there, but it was logistically going to be extremely difficult. You keep going east, and this was, uh, it's, an, it's an area called Sierra Vista. And if you look on the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center's website, you'll see that this is a hotbed of militia, Minutemen, neo-Nazi activity. And even though that 
would have been interesting to dialogue with, probably get some balloons shot down. We, we didn't want that to be the audience. In fact, that was starting to get away from our intention of, of the suture. And so we're running out of space, and we ended up down here in Agua Prieta, Douglas, Arizona. And found that that community on both sides of the border had an interest in the arts. They didn't have a lot of people who were living there. There's not a lot of work in that area. But there were a lot of artists who existed. There are a lot of artists who exist there. In fact, on Agua Prieta, on the Mexico side, they have more of an arts infrastructure than Douglas. One can go to the Casa de la Cultura and take guitar lessons for free. On Douglas, there's not so much support, but there's a strong interest in having people engage in art. And of course, artists on the southern side cannot always go to the northern side. And um, they, they welcomed a collaborative project like this. And so in 2015, with the help of both municipalities, the, we were able to put this artwork together. So 26 balloons flying at an average of 100 feet, spreading for a mile on the Mexico side and a mile on the United States side. In 2016, I was at Standing Rock. I was invited to go up there because a friend of mine and a collaborator, Chinupa Hanska Luger, is from the Standing Rock Reservation. And so he was going back and forth. He lives in Santa Fe. He was going back and forth to take supplies to water protectors to support them. He was also checking in on his, his family and, of course, his homelands. And so I, I went with him. I, I was curious what was happening. I ended up making some work that was inspired by my time there. I was there for not too long. I was, I was there for about two weeks. And, um, but of course, this was, this was a gathering that happened for months in the second half of 2016 and into 2017. The other reason I wanted to go was that I was researching this thing right here, which is called an LRAD, which stands for Long Range Acoustic Device. And I don't know if you could see this here. There's a red, <laughs> it's a red like button. And what this is, is a sonic weapon, which emits a directionalized beam that is meant to cause you to move. It's it, its intention is that it'll cause you harm. It will, uh, if you're in a crowd, that crowd will disperse. And so you see it here, presumably being used to as a as a public address system, saying, "Get off, get off of the hill." But obviously, it has another usage where, if they really wanted to, could turn on the siren, and you would run, do everything in your power to run out of that beam. And so I was hearing that these might be there, and that was another reason I wanted to go, because I was doing research on these. My sister's actually in that group of people up on the hill, and she told me that when they were beaming this up there, that she could actually feel heat in that temperature every time they spoke through it. So Post Commodity made a piece in 2017. This was exhibited at Documenta 14. It's called, The Ears Between Rules Are Always Speaking. 
and it's a long-form, two-channel, hyperdirectional sound work, narrative sound work, projected upon the ancient ruins of Aristotle's Lyceum, broadcasting for 100 days during Documenta 14, which took place in both Castle Germany and Athens, Greece. The Years Between Worlds was an all-day opera consisting of 22 songs, the libretto gathered from the narratives of refugees from Syria and Afghanistan who have arrived in Greece, stories from migrants who have traversed the desert of the U.S.-Mexico border, and stories from the Navajo Long Walk and the Cherokee Trail of Tears, both of those instances being where the U.S. government was trying to remove indigenous people from their homelands and kill them in the process. And so this, this is a funny story as well. There was, um, maybe this is a good picture. What you see at the top there is the Athens Conservatory of Music, which was a site of Documenta 14. Across the way from there, this building, is the Hellenic Armed Forces Officers Club. It's where the army, the cops, go and have banquets, pat themselves on the back. Over here, somewhere, is the War Museum. It's a museum that has artifacts from all the wars that Greeks have been involved in, all the way back to ancient times. And in the middle here was a park. And in 1996, the Music Conservatory was trying to expand, and they found the ruins of Aristotle's Lyceum. And there weren't many actual buildings there. There were some walls. There were some things they believe were, were houses, shelter. This was a library. But the main feature of, of the Lyceum, and um, this was this when they uncovered this part of it was when they realized what they what the site was is a path that encompasses the perimeter of it and this path is where Aristotle and his students would walk and talk in this uh, this idea of peripatetic learning. So our sound work which uses these two LRADs as its instruments, is beamed stereophonically at this site with the idea that one has to walk around the site to hear these narratives of forced migration. Walking the earth to hear others speak about being forced to walk the earth. And some of these songs are dialogues, so one has to walk around to hear both sides. One song was a, a kind of operetta of a man speaking to his wife on the telephone, saying that he made it to the new place and uh, making sure everything is okay back home. Here's a clip I'll play, and this is a song that is using a narrative from the Cherokee Trail of Tears, but is translated into Greek and sung by a, a musician in Athens.
For the Kalasha is a project I had started working on about 15 years ago. I wanted to make a dedication to who I thought was only a composer, this woman here. Her name is Zikala Shah, which means red bird in Lakota language. She's Yankton, Dakota. And she was born in, 18, in the late 1800s. She lived around the turn of the 20th century. I had found out about her because I was trying to find American Indians who were working with Western notation and composing way back then, yeah, 100 years ago, and trying to find pieces that I could perform or program. And I came upon her work and learned that composing music and playing music was just one of the very few things that she did. Her biography was immense. She was also a writer, a poet, a translator, an activist. She would give speeches on the situation of American Indians around the turn of the century. She wrote political essays. She founded the National Council of the American Indian, which became the American, or the National Congress of the American Indian. She taught violin. She taught music. She, she taught how to sing. And it was just a, an amazing figure that's under-recognized in American history. And so as I was researching her biography and actually going around the country and looking into different archives that exist, one in uh, Brigham Young University, one in Earlham College in Indiana, was still not finding scores. I, was find, I found the Sundance Opera and got the uh, uh, score for that. That was written in 1913. And was finding that there was a lot of controversy in her life. One example is that she was advocating for American Indian people to gain the right to vote. And was going around the country and, and trying to gauge if this was something that American Indian people wanted. She was, she was trying to gather a lot of different tribes to voice this to, within their own communities, that this was something they wanted. And a lot of Native people were saying, no, we don't want the right to vote. We don't even want to be a part of this country. If we get the right to vote, what are we opting into? She also was, had a kind of flip-flopping stance on residential schools herself. Going to residential schools, she saw that it, for herself, had its benefits of teaching music, for instance. And that's where she gained the skills to write. Of course, she was aware of abuse that has happened in those places and had kind of gone back and forth about the values of that system. Ultimately, uh, deciding that it was something that was going to be beneficial for American Indians and their children. Another one was a, a, a herself being a, an opponent of certain types of medicine, certain types of plants, particularly peyote, seeing that she thought this was destructive to certain Native communities. And this was at a time when Native people were seeking religious freedoms. And so there was some conflict there. I start realizing that this is not only a complicated person, but somebody who had to navigate a lot of conflict at that time. And so I, I kind of abandoned the project. And I also didn't know what the dedication would be. I had started this symphonic work. I didn't think that was the appropriate musical form for this this biography. Here's a page of the Sundance Opera. So I decided to change what this project would be, this dedication to Zikalasha, and write 13 
graphic notation music scores for 13 contemporary American Indian and First Nations uh, women composers working today. And these scores, in a way, are portraitures of how these artists, who are my friends, my heroes, people I highly respect, some of them collaborators, how they have navigated the 21st century. And so these were composed in collaboration with each of the people I wrote them for by way of speaking with them about their philosophies on their work on the condition of indigenous people today and where they see themselves in that, in that world, uh, both that creative world and that world that we live in of being with our tribal people. I'll talk about some of these. This is a piece called For Barbara Crowell. Barbara is a composer who's based in Toronto. She's Odawa. And this is a piece about endurance. It calls for playing the flute as long as possible. And so the, cir the, the black circle is the flute. The other shape means that you play the flute while singing, while humming, while whistling, or while hissing. This is a piece for a collaborator and musician, Cheryl LaRondale, who's Cree Métis from Saskatchewan. And this asks whoever performs the score, this is all for solo performer, anyone can play them, asks that person to sing these song lines in these shapes. So make a melody out of, uh, in the shape of the contour of those dots. And this song should be in the form of advice and should be sung in pitch black darkness. I'll talk about this one. It's a little bit hard to talk about <laughs> but, uh, yeah, because it's, it's complicated, but this is for a violinist named Heidi Sanungatuk. She's uh, a Nupiak from Alaska. And Heidi is a violinist. She's also an ethnomusicologist. Her father is named Ron Sanungatuk, he's a woodworker, a very famous an Upiak woodworker, an artist. And Heidi shared with me that she had always wanted to compose. She had always wanted to play violin in the Alaska Symphony, Anchorage Symphony. And she also wanted to work with wood. And somewhere along the lines, none of this was encouraged. She was encouraged to go into academia and since she loved music so much, she decided that path would be ethnomusicology. So the way you play this score is you get another sheet of paper and you place it over this score. And on that first line, staff, you compose a melody. And then you take the sheet of paper with the dots and place it behind the other staves of this paper and transcribe those dots onto these four skewed staves. So the song really hasn't changed, but the system has warped the song into something else. This is for a composer and vocalist, Carmina Escobar. I was trying to find women musicians in Mexico to include in this project who identified as indigenous, and I could not find any. <clears throat> the reasons why is that 
the history of colonization in Mexico is, is different than it is here in the States. There was a mixture that resulted in people not identifying by tribes, but identifying more by the nation, or as mestizo, celebrating the mixture. And so this score has the performer scream as quiet as possible. And so those black lines are the shape of the scream. And the white shapes are the shape of the mouth. Sometimes that's a smile. Sometimes that's a wide mouth. I like to think they're masks. They're different masks that you're making your face into to produce these screams. The triangles are reverse screams to try to undo the other screams. This one's too complicated to talk about. I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> it's another one about academia. <laughs> this one's for Poet Laureate Joy Harjo, three-time Poet Laureate. And this one uses diacritics as music notation. So there's, there's a, a blend of shapes. I mean, I drew all of these, but they also might incorporate other kinds of text. As you see here, this one for Candace Hopkins. Or this one using Laban notation, which is a movement notation, combining that with my own uh, vocal notation that I've used in other scores. This one, this one is for my sister, who I spoke about earlier, was at Standing Rock. This one is also performed in the darkness. It is performed in different corners of a room or the different corners of the United States. One finds radios or lamps and or lamps in these corners. And one has to go around turning lamps on and off, radios on and off, navigating and bouncing around all these corners, tracing the path of where you've traversed and marking it on the middle of the score. When all of the lamps and radios have been turned off, one goes to that point that they have crossed the most in the middle and sings the song they learned from all the radios they were turning off. This one is for my friend Laura Ortman, the violinist who lives here in New York City. And this one is about trying to live in two different places, trying to live in your home community and trying to live in a city. And the different speeds, the oscillation of the speeds of those two different environments. It's to be played on violin. And the last one I'll talk about is this one for composer Suzanne Kite, Lakota. She's also a violinist, like Zikala Shah and Laura. And she shared with me some numerology of Lakota philosophy, where the number 12 is a very sacred number. Numbers that add up to 12 and those different combinations can have significance and power. And the number three, when used, has to be approached with caution. So Suzanne is also an instrument builder, like myself. And this can be played as different parameters. You could assign these numbers as notes or pitches. You could go up four notes on the piano, then go down two notes. And you make a path and follow a path is how you play this score. But she decided to input this as code into one of her electronic instruments.
So as I was saying, I, I had started that project 15 years ago or so. And I, I was kind of stumped as to how to complete it. And when I was at Standing Rock, some, there were some profound events that got me thinking about leadership, about matriarchal roles, and that, that got me on to thinking of how to write for those 13 artists. One of those events was that while I was there on Thanksgiving weekend in 2016 at the Standing Rock uh, Water Protector Camp, the whole time I was there, there was yelling at the police, yelling at the DAPL security who were positioned up on uh, what was called Turtle Hill. On the other side of Turtle Hill is where the pipeline was being built. There were people singing the whole time I was there. It was quite beautiful. There were helicopters in the sky. There were drones flying around constantly. Not only were some of these drones from the uh, DAPL security or the police, the water protectors had their own drones. So you heard two different types of drones flying around. When I travel, when I can, I try to keep a recording device in my pocket. And again, back to this, this practice of field recording. And so I, I captured lots of audio over those two weeks, which presents itself as justifiable anger at the situation, but also a lot of, like I said, singing, a lot of moments of prayer, I suppose. I wasn't trying to, you know, stick microphones in anybody's faces, but it was just there as another set of ears for me. And there was a lot of silence that I captured of rest, of people who were exhausted from the day of protest. But after that Thanksgiving weekend where it was a critical mass, the most people had arrived at the camp, there were maybe 12,000 people, again, just yelling, go home, leave us alone, leave the land alone. After that weekend, there was this moment where the leadership of the camp, of the tribes that were represented at the camp, elder women walked onto the highway, onto this bridge called the Backwater Bridge. If those of you remember that from that time, there was a barricade that the DAPL security and the state police had put up to prevent traveling up to Bismarck, North Dakota, where uh, the reservation is linked. So thereby cutting off resources, travel, and discouraging other people from coming to join the camp. This group of women who were leading a larger group of about 300 or 400 water protectors walked up to the bridge, faced the line of police and security, and just stood and stared, not saying a word. And so this piece, Silent Choir, which was exhibited at the Whitney Biennial, is the sound of 400 people staring and having nothing to say. And it's the sound of the shame of the police and their refusal to look back.
So I'll stop that there. It goes on for about 20 minutes. Uh, this was a photograph I took of that moment from where I was standing. And so you can see the, uh, the barricade here and the police vehicles and armored tanks again. And then somebody has like a windsock there. Water is life, it says on there. I'm going to end talking about this piece. This is the one that won the Pulitzer, so I feel kind of obligated to talk about it. I haven't spoken about it yet, really. Um, well, I did at this organ festival last week, but that was like organ people. <laughs> <laughs> they, did, they had organ questions, and I, I know nothing about the pipe organ. So I'll, I'll show the score. I don't just make graphic scores. I was trained in Western music notation. I'll, I'll read my program notes for this piece. Voiceless Mass is a large ensemble work originally composed for the Nichols and Sampson organ at the Cathedral of St. John the Evangelist in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, but can be performed in any space of worship or lecture with an organ. Though Mass is referenced in the title, the piece contains no audible singing voices instead using the openness of the large space to intone the constricted intervals of the wind and string instruments. In exploiting the architecture of the space, of which the organ is connected to that space and building, Voiceless Mass considers the futility of giving voice to the voiceless when seating space is never considered an, as an option by those in positions of power. And so, this being Indigenous Peoples Day, and this nearing the anniversary of when this piece was premiered, which was a year ago, uh, I had written in the last program notes, we remember those who survived residential schools and those who did not. We recognize the role of the church in founding and administering these schools and their attempt at force assimilation which led to the losses of languages. And so here's a excerpt of this piece.
Thank you. Just in the middle. All right. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for being with us, for bringing your work. Um, and thank you to Andres for inviting me to respond and for the excuse to immerse myself for the last 24 hours in your work. Um, and I should say that. Um, this work is realized through many, so many kind of sensory channels and uh, on so many platforms with so many communities that it's hard to kind of respond in a, this highly artificial academic kind of setting. Nevertheless, uh, one quality that I find most compelling for someone like me who studies the history of the built environment um, is this, that um, Raven's work is designed to repel and preempt and defeat a pattern not only of spatial violence, but also of what I would say is a kind of second order culturalization um, that is everywhere in the history of space. And I'll just explain what I mean by that. Um, the West has a history of fighting wars that it claims is, are not cultural, um, and then brandish what it has conquered as a cultural asset to turn all war loot into a kind of thing or person that can be consumed aesthetically. Um, and one example drawn from the history of the United States is the national park system. Conquest of the Western lands um, in the 19th century was supposedly not waged against the livelihood and worldview of indigenous people, but rather for reasons of modernity, productivity, governance, even progress. And yet, the transformation of so much tribal land into monuments, so-called monuments, and the twin history of nature conservation and tribal reservations that ensued tell a different story. They tell us that the real prize of dispossession was precisely the ability to claim pristine, quiet nature as an American cultural commodity. And just so you know that I don't just mean the West in the sense of the Western Hemisphere, there are examples in the history of European cultural um, colonization as well. So um, this so-called scramble for Africa, which took place around the late 19th, early 20th century, when the alibi of resource management pushed European powers to draw lines on a map and then retroactively label as cultural or ethnic all of the violence that was produced with the project of making this map into walls and cities and um, spatial restrictions on the ground. So I mention all this because the history, I'm an architectural historian, and the history of architecture is full of spatial inventions that it originated in this way, as a way to separate and colonize. So you could say that the history of architecture as a Western discipline um, has periodically offered itself as a kind of um, its service to empires and nation states, a place where something could be passed, kind of laundered intellectually, so to speak, to receive a clean history and to become a kind of autonomous artistic gesture. So in my mind, Raven's work not only critiques the spatial legacy of wherever it takes place, wherever it intervenes, um, they also, these works also hail us as participants or as audience to recognize and or maybe co-produce, I don't know, I have that question, kind of alternate spatial and cognitive grammars. So I'll just give three examples. The repellent fence, um, it was repellent in a sense that the kind of pathetic border fence could never be. You know, the, the border wall pathetically clings to the ground, whereas the fence floats across and it anchors itself on the land without making a mark on it. It kind of makes this planetary line of stewardship but it also, because of the iconography of the balloon and the kind of humor around that and the, and the eye, it dwarfs all the tactics of psychological warfare that border patrol and security companies trade in. Um, Silent Choir, another example, um, 
If I understand correctly, at some point, uh, Raven composed a libretto that named all of the participants, that there were the border patrols and there were the protesters and there were tourists and there were other people. And I think that that's, you know, in no uncertain terms, calling the bluff of the, of the geopolitical theatrics that are on the ground, but at the same time also very powerfully leaving no doubt that, about what we should do but with silence, that we should amplify silence, that silence does not signify consent. That if there's a Western tradition par excellence, is the idea that silent is, to be silent is to consent. Um, one more example, the, the recent um, composition, Voiceless Mass, which you just played. It's a piece of immense kind of sonic uh, materiality. It kind of confuses you, especially if you watch the performance. You, you didn't know that those instruments made those noises. You don't recognize the instruments anymore. Um, and yet, at the same time, there's no doubt that the organ is a wind instrument and actually that this wind is the kind of architectonic breath and that it's the same wind that is flowing not neutrally in air conditioning, but in sort of real space. Um, so for architects and designers who are interested in shedding our disciplinary uh, prejudices, especially the ones where space is a kind of neutral thing, um, it's not so much that I think there are lessons, but it seems to me that one can embrace instrumentation, that we can operate between media and take the repertoire of electronic music or whatever your favorite electronic medium is and apply it to a spectrum of, of human environmental signals, not only to you know, a very pristine little signal that is fed to you. So those are my remarks. I have many questions, but I'll maybe just go with one, mm -hmm. which is kind of geeky, but it has to do with the graphic, almost a kind of dissonance between the graphic, your graphic work uh, which is very delicate and symmetrical and inventive and beautiful and kind of dances on the page, whether it's your own notations or when you're adopting a kind of, you know, uh, libretto with the, all the, uh, the usual markings. But they're often suggestions and, and scores for like really wildly resonant, booming, you know, over amplified notes that the whole building can hear. So. Do you think of that as a difference? Is the performer's performer meant to kind of struggle? Or on the contrary, do you think, well, one is performing something that aims for the completeness that is also on the page? Do you see what I'm saying? That there's a kind of, actually two different things. So, you know, in architecture, when you draw something, eventually it has to be built. And it's, there's, there's this fantasy that there's a transparency in the thing you draw towards the thing that you produce. So that would be my first kind of question. Yeah, thank you, Lucia. There's, there's a, uh, I feel like there's five questions in the one question, um, <laughs> which is great, which is great. Um, there's a, I mean, you saw the score for Voiceless Mass or parts of it. I, there's a benefit to working in just Western notation in that it can be very exact. It can be the building that is, needs to be built somewhat precisely. And that's a benefit to working in that kind of notation is you can get a very precise reading of, of that composition. I think what my reasons for making graphic notation, and of course this was something that was developed through the 20th century with other composers, is seeking that freedom of interpretation that one can have in music, that it could be different every time. Not quite an improvisation, but something that maybe is more open-ended. And when I think of my reasons for doing that, it extends even further that it's, there's a potential there for non-musicians to be a part of these, these actions or these situations. So when I, it's one of the reasons I showed Drum Grid is that that's an invitation for anybody in that community to come and be out on the street with a drum. And what I enjoy about that piece is the, not only are there misinterpretations, it's kind of hard to tell from the video that it just looks like they're, they're not listening. <laughs> they're actually spread out very far and there's traffic and all these things, a bus drives in between. It becomes very complicated very quickly, but not only are there those misinterpretations, but the public who has stumbled upon these performers in the streets oftentimes misinterprets this as well as some kind of protest, 
or some other kind of you know, uh, single action, and then they realize they're surrounded by 20 drummers in this neighborhood. So in a way, it creates conflict. It generates conflict, which it was not an intention of the piece. It was, it was actually to do the opposite. It was to get people to walk around their own neighborhoods, their own city spaces, to engage with um, things that might be in those places too, waterways, monuments, statues, buildings. Um, and so the graphic notation, I mean, back to that, it's, it's an opportunity for, I guess a, it's a frame that's a duration. And inside of that, there's pretty specific instructions on what to do. At the same time, these symbols can have multiple meanings. I mean, surely they have sonic uh, instructional value, but also they, they might carry other kinds of history with them. Even the music no regular music notation has a lot of history in it. The fermatas, the, uh, the staff lines, as I spoke about in the Heidi Sanungatuk piece, um, all come loaded with, with um, with different meanings and also the, this expectation of virtuosity inside of them. And so when I use those notations, the Western music notations inside of something that's maybe more graphic or hand-drawn or whatever, uh, it's, it's to reference that. It's to reference that system. It's to reference that education and that Western tradition of, of that notation. Yeah, um, thanks, Raven, for um, for that presentation, for well, the, the, the gifts that you've uh, given us tonight, and uh, the gifts that are um, that are your body of work. And um, I, like Lucia, have spent the last several hours or twenty-four hours, uh, a big portion of that, on a plane back from Venice today, <laughs> listening to your work. Um, but I, I want to pick up on maybe a little bit of what Lucia was getting at, but also maybe to talk about um, the presence of absence in your work. Um, and I was struck by the, by the score for uh, Voiceless Mass, being a little bit of a musician myself, of, you know, of, of seeing that much white space in terms of where the staffs were broken and what have you, and also with the graphic notations, just how they, yes, they hold this page, but also there are still lots of absence or lots of white space. And um, one of the works that, um, actually it's, I guess it's a trilogy, um, the, uh, you did not speak about it this evening, but I do wanna sort of touch on it, the um, American Ledger one, two, and three, which hasn't, I don't think anyone's heard three yet, um, I want to sort of talk about that one. But what, sh what strikes me about um, uh, the American Ledger, particularly American Ledger 1 and I think, or 2, and I think you described it to um, Frank Arteri as being, well, it's about forced, more forced migration, but I think you said it was, it's like a, a hot potato versus crabs in a bucket. I think I got that quote right. Fighting for resources, um, the question of does it create chaos or does it create organization? And it seems to me that when I was listening to that, that that's in, let's say, uh, acute counter-distinction to, to a piece like, you know, uh, the great American landscape by someone like Aaron Copeland or something that is so, let's say, complete or so full in a certain way, sweeping and full. Um, and in your work, it seems that yeah, maybe not incompleteness, but absence mm -hmm. allows for the kind of another presence to fill something in. And I think you even have spoken about voiceless mass in, in that way that the, you know, that the, the inaccessibility of space and that the absence makes rooms for voices which have been suppressed. So I'm wondering if you might talk a little bit about um, your notion of, of, of absence and the, and, and the presence of absence. Yeah, thank you, Mario. Um, I mean, first, it, it's probably an aesthetic, a sonic aesthetic for me to 
work with those voids or those absences to leave space for instruments. It's my tactic for orchestrating these things, especially a large ensemble piece like Voiceless Mass or some of the others that have a lot of instruments. Um, but really, I mean, I mean, any instrumentation, even the solo pieces might have opportunities for nothing to happen and time to just pass as that is, as that silence is filling that, that space. But also, I think there's, I mean, in a lot of these scores, there's also this opportunity for interaction between people who are performing with each other. And so I like to, when I'm composing these, and I'm, I'm mostly just talking about the, I mean, the installations can be a, a totally different thing, but the compositions oftentimes are written in mind that it's only for the people who are playing them. So it's an interaction between, let's say, a string quartet, the four people who are playing the piece together. And there are things that only they know because they've studied the score, because they've spent time in the rehearsal room doing these things together. And if there's any kind of difficulty, you know, difficult passages, complexity in the music, it's to create a shared experience between those four people. And so the experience of those four people, my hope, produces some kind of result, some kind of artifact of that shared experience that then gets relayed on to listeners. And I don't know if that's always the case because I'm in a weird position of being the one who composed it, but um, I, you know, it's hard for me to sometimes step out and see if I can have that experience as a listener, but that's the intention. And so the space facilitates that, the, the, the absences, they're there for those conceptual reasons, especially if the piece is programmatic or narrative, those voids mean something. They might mean a loss of memory. They might mean a time before humans existed, which is the case of American Ledger One, uh, which tells a chronology of this land that's now the United States. And so there's voids in that. There's voids when things were lost, when languages were lost, when people were displaced when people were moved here from other continents. Um, American Ledger 2, that one is a really complicated, that might be the most complicated score that I've written. And it is about, all of these American Ledger scores are based on flags of the places that they are telling the story of. So number one is a kind of abstraction of the US flag as we know it. Uh, number two is the Oklahoma state flag. So telling the story of the, dis the forced movement of tribes from the south into Oklahoma, which was Indian territory, but at the same time talking about other communities that have ended up in Oklahoma, in Tulsa, particularly the successful black community of Tulsa that was driven out in, in the race riots of Tulsa, the Black Wall Street event. So that being a forced migration out of Oklahoma. So you have this kind of cycle that's, um, that the score and the music itself is trying to tell the story of through its resources of its instruments, which are drumsticks that get traded between uh, participants. American Ledger Three is a dedication to Ida B. Wells, who was bringing to attention lynchings that were happening in the South. She had to move up to Illinois to get her writings published and eventually had to go on to England. So it's to bring even greater attention to what was happening. And so that's modeled after the centennial flag of Illinois and is for two women's choirs. It's actually being performed next weekend, October the 22nd for the first time. It was composed two years ago, but it was a COVID thing where it didn't happen. So we're finally gonna do it up in Verplank at a place called Kino Saito uh, on the 22nd. But um, I mean, I wanna respond more about this, this absence. I think, you know, I, I was thinking I think I can answer something Lucia also said about, um, had brought up about the Standing Rock piece. 
and other pieces resulted from my experience there. And it's a score that my wife Candace and I wrote called Dispatch. And what that is is a text score. It's part text score. It's part transcription of things that I witnessed at Standing Rock. And it's part role playing game. <laughs> and it's, um, it's, it's a way to consider and analyze the dynamics of any kind of protest or gathering you might engage in. So whether that's something here on the streets, you know, uh, a, a protest against a monument, which was happening also, you know, all across the country over the past couple of years, um, or it's something like Standing Rock, thinking of who is there with you? Who are the undercover cops? Who are the allies? Who are the people who live in this place that you're gathering at? Who are you? You know, are you a visitor? Or do you live there? It's a way to consider all of those things and think of if there's a sole message that needs to come out of this gathering, what are the means of carrying that message and relaying that message to others? And is that message getting distorted? Is it spreading adequately? Is it getting muffled or silenced? And um, another part of it too is this, as we're working on this score, it got me thinking about what's called deep listening, this kind of uh, opportunity to listen to the environment, to perhaps meditate. And it's, a, it's, a, it's something that was de developed by composer Paulino Oliveros. And it, it has this relation, I think, to the ideas of John Cage, that you know, silence is something that maybe cannot exist. One becomes aware of the other sounds in their environment, which I fully support until it turns into something that is a new age encroachment in the desert where I'm from, and people are going and uh, putting up teepees, <laughs> neon teepees in my homeland, and uh, doing mushrooms or whatever, and doing deep listening. Hey, it's all, I get it, but um, it's a bit of that. It's thinking of, of um, a privilege of silence, you know, a privilege of quiet environments. So dispatch says that one does a deep listening in a place where they have the LRADs, where they have water cannons, where they have the drones and the helicopters, or where there's a loudspeaker all night saying, um, you know, you got to move out of Standing Rock. Um, and just to kind of pick up on that, in, in terms of those spaces, are, are those also moments in which there's a kind of, let's say, attunement of, of the body that occurs. And I'm thinking of the way in which the, you know, your score sometimes have instructions for what one should do with one's body or how you should move or, um, let's say, the um, uh, drum square, for example. You know, that's very much a kind of performance, bodily performance. There are other works of yours like, um, I think it's Trimble Staves um, that was uh, from a few years ago, um, in which the the body becomes, let's say, instrumentalized mm -hmm. in the in, in the work. So, you know, yes, there are these absences, but that's also a place in which, even in the the silence, I would imagine that the the body becomes somehow attuned mm -hmm. to the space or to that void or to that absence. Does that make sense? It does, and, and I have to admit it's not something I've given much thought to, really. Um, I do acknowledge the differences in, in who might be performing these. Let's say a trained percussionist who is going to have a certain physical technique versus um, somebody who's, who's not, you know, doesn't have that kind of background, how they might play music. And, and maybe working with that as a musical idea um, a lot of these pieces are, they're not anti-virtuosity uh, uh, or anything like that, they're, but I'm interested in the variation that can happen in, in different bodies doing these things. And that, you know, it could be a difference between a young person playing the same score or an old person, you know, older person might not have the same kind of reaction to something. I'm not saying the older person is gonna be slower or anything like that. I'm saying there's different knowledge in, in interacting with this. 
this instrument. Uh, one thing I am interested in terms of, of the body, though, and it, and it is a reason I, I make these scores accessible, is that I'm interested in who might be on stage representing these pieces. It's, it can be quite, um, you know, a, a limited uh, presence of, of diversity on some of these classical music stages. So uh, an example I can give is the Kronos Quartet piece, which demands that a woman be in the string quartet or else it can't be played because it's written in a way that the musicians get lost and it needs a woman to be in the quartet to say, okay, we're back on track here. Uh, and, in, and in that sense, it, it allows drift, it allows variation. Um, but it's important to me who, who might be in these places, who, who's on stage. Drum grid is very much about that. Um, you know, allowing people who are from certain communities to be the people on the streets. It's not bussing in professional musicians to go out to, <laughs> to uh, I don't know, the, the south of Albuquerque and do this thing. It's getting the people who live there to do it. But I'll have to think more about, about your question because I'm interested in that. You know, the more, I, uh, the more I work on different kind of scores, the more I collaborate with choreographers, different, different artists, who work with movement. I've been interested in that recently. I recently did a collaboration with a choreographer who's also based here, Emily Johnson. And that got me thinking a lot about, about how to collaborate with dancers and people who work with movement, but also have them make sound. So I've been, I've been more conscious of, of how that, that is to take place. And also, you know, making instruments for people and, and that kind of thing. If I can follow up on that, okay. that um, I was really struck by that piece you showed, um, My Blood is in the Water, mm. which is mm. basically mm. like a physical, historic timeline, but vertical, uh, you know, with the, where time begins in the sky and then sort of gradually drips onto the drum, which is amplified. Um, what's, the, what's the nature of sort of time? Because obviously if you're a musician, your medium is time, you're sort of keeping uh, rhythm and yet one senses that you're you leave the performer quite free essentially to so how first of all how do you how do you instruct or advise your performers to, to keep time I, f I feel like I, I get to answer the previous question with the question <laughs> that just gets asked we planned it that way <laughs> Your question gets me thinking of a way to answer Mario's question about the score I showed with the, playing the flute as long as possible. Right. And so that's going to be different with every performer, right? Somebody might be able to hold it for like minutes, and somebody might have a limited time they could do that. And in that sense, the body is, you know, the individual and their body is going to be extremely important and is going to be the, the, the sole factor in how that piece gets played. And so I'm interested in those kinds of fluctuations in time being maybe dependent on that, on who's playing it, on, again, the interactions of the people involved in that, that dynamic. The setting is very important in a lot of these pieces. Drum grid just being one example, but a lot of them are to be performed outdoors or in unconventional spaces, public spaces sometimes. And so those might determine something like duration or speed. Drum grid, the only instruction for drum grid to end is that something will end it. So that could be like a, a bus goes between the sight line of two performers. It could mean the cops come. One ended one time because a, a neighbor, a guy said, get off my lawn to a drummer and tr try to fight him. So that ended the piece. Um, but th those kinds of things I like to, to determine something that to me is already fluid. You know, I, I, the metronomic way of keeping time in these pieces uh, is not interesting to me. Some of these pieces do have conductors, but the conductor also has these kind of wrenches thrown in at them that will alter time for them. And all of this, again, is just talking about the experience of the people learning the piece or engaged in sounding the piece. Of course, every person in the audience is gonna have their own idea, if I'm successful, about how long that piece existed for. 
You know, so something like Voiceless Mass, we just did at that organ festival, and some people were like, wow, that was, only, that was only 10 minutes? I was like, no. And I didn't tell them how long it was, and other people said, wow, that was 30 minutes. I said, no, it wasn't, it wasn't that either. Um, so that's when it's successful, when, <laughs> when I get that kind of feedback. I hope that answered your question. I don't it does, know. It does, because I was going to say that it's what seems like the rigor that in Western music would usually reside in this kind of ideal of regular time, um, of nested scales of time, has been shifted somewhere else so that you still make it impossible for it to just be this kind of atemporal, without a referent, sort of delirious, delirium of t atemporality. Like you're very specific. This piece is about Ida B. Wells. This piece is about, or is a, you know, you do your research on uh, Zitkala Shah. Is that saying that right? Um, it seems to me that's a really specific, that's also temporal, that's like a very specific history, which suddenly in your hands deserves its specificity, quite aside from, so that's time too, that's all I'm saying, is that there's a kind of, there's historical time which then, um, you know, gets its sort of due, and I think that's powerful, and in a way without it, I can imagine the uh, John Cage plus mushrooms <laughs> would lead to something else. We should probably take questions if um, the yeah, audience maybe has Maybe time them. for one or two questions. Yeah. Um, maybe this person in the front had their hands up, and then we'll go there. Okay, uh, so I think There's a microphone coming your way. Oh, okay. Hi. Um, thanks so much, Raven, and happy indigenous people today. Um, it's interesting that this talk is in the, uh, the School of Architecture. It makes me think about you know, what it would mean for the reception of your work to be informed by indigenous paradigms of things like uh, reception and criticism that are from an indigenous um, perspective. So um, I guess the question has to do with you know, f frames of understanding that um, that may be positive things like um, relations, relations to place, specifically maybe land, um, relations that can be um, defined as, uh, you know, a, a defining of notions of sovereignty, for example. So I'm just, I'm just wondering if, um, if you think about uh, that, if you think about how your work is. Uh, Received whether within this framing of a uh, you know arch school of architecture at, uh, at uh, Columbia or it's framed in a different way that is more a more kind of an, uh, um, informed by indigenous paradigms of un understanding yeah, as a whole like all all of the work I mean uh, the, the 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 chamber music stuff. Is, weird, is a weird place to start from for me because its venue is so limited, really. I mean, they're, they're designed as sonic spaces, but really they're, they're probably the most inaccessible places one could have music, you know. They, they, they don't even look like a place you would want to sit in sometimes. Um, sometimes they're too expensive, the tickets are too much to go see the symphony or whatever. And you know, there's reasons for that. It's expensive. Everybody should get paid for what they do. But um, and I don't know if there's a solution around that, at least in this country. But um, for me to work in that medium or in that tradition does prevent people from my community to go to those things. Is that kind of what you're? You know, your reference work like uh, Dylan Robinson's, uh, you know, um, development of, you know, I indigenous paradigms for things like notions of listening or silence and things like that. So I'm just wondering if, uh, if you feel like there's, there, there, there needs to be much more development of that kind of theorizing that allows for the reception of your work to, to go mm. there. 
perhaps. Um, in, in academic institutions or uh, in other, in other places? <laughs> I, I think I feel that constantly again, but more mostly with the with the chamber stuff, because of of the audiences that are able to see that, um, and that's probably why I do a lot of these things outside. I think there's also a part of what I do that's that's curatorial, you know, running a record label, doing these other things, running venues before. Um, I, you know, for me that maybe solves or tries to solve that, uh, but, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if I have an answer to that. Yeah. And I, I just wonder um, that perhaps it's not so much a, a question about sort of theorizing, but yeah. it, it comes down to, I think what you're getting at is that uh, there's a different way of knowing or a different epistemology that there's this kind of Western way of knowing and of composing and, pro and producing and, and writing and what you're offering, and I don't want to use the word other, but what you're offering is something different, um, which is, let's say, outside of that, outside of that canon of, you know, and, and that epistemology. I think so, but the, I think where I have to be careful is where this where this might relate to indigenous worldviews or traditions or ceremony would be one mm -hmm. situation where my links to that or if there was a, a potential to place this into that space, then you know, there's a whole different set of protocols that this might not align with, this kind of work. And so that's the thing that kind of has me floating between these two places, I think. With, with, and so, that's not with every piece, but I could see some pieces where that, that's gonna be in conflict. Even the deer piece, I mean, there's, I, I can tell when it's in that space when there's a lot of uh, polarization between responses of indigenous people. And some of those pieces. There's another one where he butchered a sheep in a in a motel room, um, which also had that same kind of response. With music, I mean, it's it might. I think I think one of my other tactics to dealing with that was building my own instruments, because instruments can become a very sacred or powerful thing to deal with. And while I have an interest in indigenous instruments, they're not always going to be accessible to be used in a, you know, in a situation like I want to use them. So uh, thinking of that, that's, that's probably why I ended up working with electronics, working with building my own things. Thank you so much, Raven. Um, thinking um, about the connection between field recordings and silent choir, um, it reminded me of a conversation on harsh noise, to be specific, about the allure of the atonality, a rhythm, a lack of harmony, in a way it's a chaos. Being a letting go of a system, a noting system, a, the composition to welcome something that you might not have complete control over. Um, and then that contrasted with your compositions. I was just wondering a little bit of how these field recordings, these um, pieces that, to an, to an extent you're just there, situated a body within a mass, how that informs the, the compositions and vice versa. How you see your role as a composer change, affect, curate the field recordings. One thing about the field recordings is, even from that first one, I think there was uh, uh, an, in, an intention to avoid being anthropological with the field recording. 
So that was part of my reason for turning it up, tossing fidelity out the window, because I didn't want to, I didn't want to try to explain or document the earth, the land or its animals, and maybe get something else out of it, color, I don't know. Uh, speed, maybe there was some kind of audible pace or tempo in there. Always thinking about the musical parameters. Of course, pitch goes out the window with something like that, but, um, but you hear things. I mean, you'll, you'll hear like birds and little things in, in one of them. And, um, and same, maybe that, that was also coming full circle to the silent choir one, thinking that this had a different kind of presence to it. This had this kind of weight you, you feel when you hear that many people being quiet. And so that, at the same time, because nobody's actually making much sound, can also avoid being anthropological, like you're going to capture their voices. But how that influences the, the compositions, I'm not, I'm not sure if they, if they do. You know, I keep the electronic and the noise stuff kind of separate from the, the chambers, chamber things. Um, I rarely use electronics in any of the chamber music and, and vice versa, you know. Maybe in, in, I mean, when I make recordings for like uh, albums and things, those, those are totally different as well. But, um, you know, I think something like, again, like Silent Choir, it, it, it already had its own window of, of duration. The second people started leaving the site, that's when it ended. And so that's where the recording just kind of cuts off. Uh, and field rec the, the first one, the field recordings, that could go on forever. And I, I have very long versions of those recordings. And they, I have them play on a loop because I like to envision that they would be going forever, you know, with the, no presence of people or vehicles or anything like that. So in a way, there's, you know, there, and I couldn't do that with a composition. I couldn't have somebody play violin forever <laughs> or something, you know. So I, I, I do treat them very different, and I, I think they, the, um, the, 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 the works like the field recordings can exist in a place that's not improvisation either. Improvisation maybe being a third one, or that that is a very real-time kind of uh, response to music itself. And, and maybe that's the body part too, like myself as an improviser on my instrument, on my electronics, I play guitar also. Um, that becomes a very physical, physically responsive thing or a, another kind of interaction that's not composed. Can I try my hand one more? Um, um, as soon as you have a recording device, and are able, and then, and as soon as one intervenes, as soon as an artist has a recording device, and as soon as an artist intervenes in a basically guerrilla act, um, a responsibility will be assumed. It will be assumed that you are responsibly, you're responsible for reproducing the sound that you got, or that it's somehow representing something, or that you now have a rep representational responsibility to the persons on, on whose behalf you're advocating. So I guess maybe one way to rephrase that question you, you were being asked before is, do you feel a responsibility? Does responsibility name something that's useful to you um, as someone who is actually a composer? A composer, of course, has responsibility because you have to decide. You, you're sort of orchestrating people. Does the word responsibility weigh on you or not? With music? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In, no, no. In or in my private music. life. Or no, no. In making music. <laughs> um, in making absolutely, works. absolutely. I'm, I'm always, again, I'm always conscious of who the piece might be intended for first as musicians, who I can include if it's something that is, can only be played by somebody like Kronos Quartet, then what does that mean? You know, what is, what, who, I, I think there's a link there between who would be playing it and who the audience will end up being for that. And so I, I most definitely feel responsibility 
there. I feel responsibility every time I do a kind of noise thing. You know, I, wanna, I don't want to be obnoxious, really. I mean, my reasons for <laughs> making noise is a, is a sound. I appreciate the sound of it. Um, I appreciate the physicality of what that can do, you know, very loud music, very low tones. It's kind of um, this kind of immersive experience one can have in that concert setting. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I've done some dangerous pieces. I didn't show the piece for guns. There's a piece for firearms where it's all notated and you play shotguns and uh, rifles and things. Obviously, there's a responsibility there. Uh, both performers and audience. But um, is, are you asking of something maybe further than of a, of a responsibility of, of the out, maybe the outcome of, of the work or the influence of the work or? Yeah, I was asking about the concept of fidelity. Like what are you, you know, in music basically there's, there's always noise and there's always, and it seems to me that the intentional fallacy is even stronger in music and in composition than in, in, than in just, let's say, without, you know, uh, storytelling without musical notation and without translations. There are so many layers of translation that um, the, the very notion, let's say, that an anthropological recording would somehow, you know, that anthropologist has to somehow bear the, the responsibility of their act and be a transparent agent. I just it didn't seem, I mean, I, your answer about responsibility I hear, but it sounds like that of the composer vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the art form or something, rather than to like a reality or to a, you know, kind of cause of, um, a broader cause. There was one more question right there. Oh, and, and Ignacio, you'll be the last one. Thank you, Raven, for your talk. I have a question about pedagogy or when people come to you. I don't know if you teach, but if you teach or when you teach or when people want to learn from you, how do you, um, what is your approach then to the like score techniques you use, specifically like 20th century Western notational practices it seems like references like Cage or Oliveros or even earlier of just general 20th century modernism, they're references in your work, but they're not the primary references. They're kind of more, um, I see them as maybe auxiliary or part of your notational language. How do you then approach speaking or teaching a young composer? Do you prescribe or suggest or recommend learning these notations? Yeah. Um, right now I'm teaching a, a couple different places. I'm teaching at the Institute of American Indian Arts. Mario Cotto here is the director of that program. Um, and I also teach a program I've been teaching for 18 years called the Native American Composer Apprentice Project, where I teach kids on the reservation to write string quartets. So maybe talking about that one is, um, it's an opera, what that project is, is I have a week with young people to have them write a composition. And what happens in this project is a quartet, string quartet, for a long time it was a, a quartet, Ethel Quartet, also based here in New York City, would go out to the reservation and work with the students to play their music and then they'd put on a concert at the Grand Canyon. Ethel is very versed in experimental techniques. A student could write a graphic score, draw some line, and say, play this. Um, to me, I wouldn't be doing my job if the kid turned in something like that. You know, I had a kid one time write, improvise, <laughs> and turn it into Ethel. So I, I abandoned that pretty quick, because uh, the kids were too smart. They, they figured out they could just draw, I mean, some artists haven't figured this out yet. They make a score. <laughs> Play this. Uh, I'm joking, but <laughs> to, it was how I learned. It was my entry to, to music making. It is a rigid system. And these kids, half the schools out on the reservation don't have music programs. 
they, there's, they don't have arts programs. And that's not limited to the, the Navajo and Hopi reservations. That's all over this country. It's, you know, the arts are not a priority. And the ones that do have a music program, they, uh, they only have a, a music program because the sports team is really good. So they needed a marching band. <laughs> and so they hired a music teacher because, you know, to go to the tournament or whatever. Um, so I have to teach them music notation in a week, knowing that, or letting them know that this, they're gonna meet the string quartet halfway with this language, you know. And they can expand on that music notation like I do. You know, they could then draw the vibrato or something or the volume and come up with their own notations. There's definite room for creativity there but I feel that they need some kind of starting point. And for me, that makes the most sense. Even though it's a Western music tradition, it's, it's still a timeline. We're still talking about time. We can talk, talk about any concepts they want to bring to the table, whether that's something relating to their tribal worldviews or, or anything else. You know, I think that's my work is to fit that into that, that system. And oftentimes, you know, a student will have no musical background and at minimum they learn what a whole note is for you musicians here. They'll, they'll at least know how to write, draw a whole note and what that means and maybe find middle C on the staff, or, which exists on all the staves. And they'll at least write a composition for middle C whole notes. But they could do all these other things. I show them how to ricochet the bow and how to, you know, vibrate the string and do all this stuff. And to me, that's the more interesting music. That's the music I like to listen to is, is that, that kind of thing. Anybody else, like other artists, like we, we teach at IEI, there are some students that, um, who are interested in, in using scores as a way to organize performance or organize other situations or to just maybe even organize their own methods of making something that's gonna be non-musical. And so that's an opportunity to do, to do something maybe more, more complicated because maybe the discipline is there, they're not going to, like I said, just turn in the squiggle and say, play this. So text is, I mean, text is something I, I always like to see if a score is possible with text first. If, if voiceless mass was possible with just text, maybe I would have gone that way. But it's something I always consider when working on something, is maybe there's a way to just explain what one can do. But at the same time, not be overly instructional. With the Zikalasha scores, that was the last thing any of these women needed, is me saying, do this. <laughs> the project was not about that. It was, actually, it was about the opposite of that, me being a listener and maybe transcribing something that can become a prompt. Hi. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for this uh, uh, beautiful lecture. I have a simple question uh, uh, about your experience in performing some of these pieces in different locations. And I'm thinking, for example, about uh, performing the same piece in Boulder, Colorado, and uh, Norway, Oslo, or the relationship between the side of recording in Standing Rock and performing in a museum or here. Like, the, what, like thinking about what travels and what doesn't, what's communicated and what's not. Uh, and the reason why I'm asking is because it seems uh, like, I mean, I mean, the things that I have in mind is the way in which uh, uh, music has been made to travel either as anthems uh, for national communities or for other kinds of communities, or has participated in the construction of diasporic communities, uh, or, and it seems to me that your sound art does something that is completely different from those two, but it's uh, still related to locations. Uh, so that's why I'm uh, interested in the relationship between Boulder and Oslo, or Standing Rock and the Whitney, uh, uh, and what's communicated in your experience, like just listening to them in those six spaces. Thank you. Yeah, that's hard to think about. I, I mean, surely something like like drum grid, like I was saying, is is 
reliant upon the people who will end up or who get asked to be representing the piece or who get asked to enact it. So those will have its own site-specific sound. I'm interested that Boulder, Colorado has its own sound. Oslo has its own sound. I don't know how to conjure that necessarily. I mean, that, maybe there's an attempt in all of these to see if that comes out and I can learn something from that. The middle C whole note sounds different on the Navajo reservation or over in Mongolia. You know, I'm interested in that for sure. And, and maybe all of these in some way can be that, that experiment or that, that study to see if, if there is a difference or, or if I learn something from that, maybe that ends up in another piece or another iteration of the piece. I've made scores that um, are generative They've, they've, I didn't consider them done until I went through processes like that. Like I, I had them played by a group of people and something, I learned something from that that maybe only happened because of them and then I went and revised the score, did it again somewhere else and so forth. Um, same with audiences, maybe it was something about who was there to listen or a configuration of the audience for instance. But, um, but yeah, I, I think that's all the way to answer, to answer that question. I guess. So with that final yes, I think we maybe can uh, give you a break and a well-earned um, uh, evening uh, with the rest of us. So please join me in uh, thanking Raven Tricone. <laughs>